Time for a tour of some of my code. Let's begin with the buyable class. This class I've built to be the parent of all items that are purchasable or buyable in the store. And inside of the, in this class, I have three different variables, a price, an item name, and an item category. Any item that's in my store will have some of this information set, or actually all of this information set. You can see here, in the constructor of my buyable class, I require each of these three pieces of data to be passed in and assigned so that every buyable item has at least this information. I've also generated some getter and setter methods to be able to access and change these later if I want to be able to through some administrator account, although that hasn't been implemented just yet. Next, I have three different types of buyable items. You'll notice that each of these extends buyable, meaning they're child classes. So each of them needs to send information to the parent class's constructor. Buyable clothing extends buyable, meaning that it has access to price, name, and category, but it adds on another variable, size, that's relevant to clothing that might not be relevant to other types of viable things. When I instantiate it, I need the information about these three things. However, because the category is just clothing, because it's viable clothing, I just pass this in as a kind of mandatory value to the super constructor here. But price is passed along to the parent, name is passed along to the parent, but size is kept held in this child class because it's only relevant to this inheriting class. And I've allowed access to get size, but I haven't allowed a setter because I don't want the size to be changed later. I just want it to be retrievable. We'll see something similar in the food class here. It also extends buyable, meaning that it needs a price and name to pass on. And I've customized that the category is food to keep track of that. However, I have another independent variable, private variable here called weight, which is relevant to the food type item with a getter for it. Finally, I have a game class that also extends Bible, meaning once again, it sends along the price and the name, however, well, and the game category. However, I've added two custom variables in here, the number of players the game might be able to host and a string for the genre of game, because that's relevant in the storefront, at least in my mind right now. Of course, getter methods for each of these. So this is the kind of the core data. The items that I'm going to be populating my store with are built from these four classes. Do take note that I'm not going to buy, uh, build any items that are just buyable. Everything that I actually create as an object will be from one of these three classes. This is just a generic parent class that the other three inherit from to have a common baseline of information. You could add some content in here. Maybe you want to decide that you want there to be another category of information that's relevant for all of your items. For example, maybe an item number, or maybe you want to have a uh, what it costs you amount so that you know the profit that you're earning, that you have a sell price, but an item cost when you bought it from whoever sourced it to you. And so that you can actually kind of keep track of making sure that you never reduce an item's price so that you lose money. You could add another variable in for that. Okay, what other classes do we have here? I also have created a bank account for you. This is how you're able to store and access and work with your money. It has two different variables, a password that you set and a balance that you set, both of them when the bank account is first initialized. You can see here that when the initial deposit, or sorry, when the bank account is created in the constructor, you have to give it its initial depo deposit as well as set the password. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a bit more of an algorithm for setting the password here, but really all it's doing is just asking the player or the user to enter a password and then confirm the password so that kind of like you do on a website when it asks you to type it in twice to make sure the passwords are the same and that you haven't typoed somewhere in there. It requires you in a bit of a system here to actually have the password match or equal the previous one that you entered. And if you fail, it's going to ask you to set your password again. As long as you fail, it's going to kind of force you to loop back through this until you get it right. And then only then will it let you move along and confirm your password. I've also provided a method here that allows you to check if you're able to afford an item. You're going to send in the amount the item costs and compare it to the balance in your account. And if everything works out, it's going to return true so that you can process some logic later. Otherwise, it'll tell you you don't have enough money and it'll return false. Kind of similarly, if we actually want to make a purchase, I'm going to tell my bank account the amount of money that I'm looking to spend 
And it's gonna, now that I'm actually trying to make a purchase, what I've required is that I check the password of the user just to make sure for security purposes that no one's doing anything malicious or nefarious. And if they make it through that password check, which is another method down here I'll talk about in a sec, then we check if they actually have enough money in their account. And if they do, then they're able to make the purchase. Otherwise, the purchase fails. A quick method for returning the actual balance remaining in the account so you can kind of check in how much money you have left to spend. And this check password method, which actually takes requires the user to, uh, to type in a password and then returns true if the password is correct or false if it's not. So a nice variety of functionality to kind of make a pseudo bank account in a simple way for us to work with our storefront. Moving along. In our runner class, it's very simple. In Java, we need to have this public static void main. I don't wanna deal with the static all the time, so I'm just simply creating one runner class where my program begins and it builds a store and then everything else is gonna happen inside that store. So let's just move right along into the store itself. Actually, I'm gonna review this one last. So let's jump to the store inventory first, which is the class responsible for populating all of the items that my store contains. And you'll see at the top that I have three different array lists. One's for the viable clothing, one's for the viable food, and one's for the viable games. When this class is instantiated, these are all empty and they just exist. And once and this, as the store is created, it's gonna go through a process of populating each of these lists with all the items that I want them to have. So I got a couple, uh, oh, it's glitching around here, getters and setters, but this is where the really interesting stuff happens down here. Um, near the bottom, my populate close inventory, I go through and I just, this is where I've built in all the data for this example project. Hoodies, shoes, and gloves, just some different clothes. I just thought up of prices, names, and sizes. However, you'll notice that I actually am able to add multiple of a certain item if I want to. So I'm actually creating three gloves and adding three of them. So everywhere up here, I'm only adding one of the item, but here I'm adding three at once, kind of like a bulk order being added. And something similar for the food inventory as well as our games inventory. These are the helper methods to populate all of those different items. So if you wanna add some of your own custom items to the storefront, here's, here might be a good spot for you to inject some of your ideas, or maybe you wanna even make your own category of item types. Of course, you'd have to add another class to do that as well on the side. Down here, the add multiple, I wanna explain one thing really quick. One of the problems when I'm adding multiple is that I send it an item. Now. I've noticed that I'm sending this method a buyable item, but there's times where when I add multiple, I send it a food, buyable food item, and other times where I'm sending it a buyable clothing. So these are two different types of items, a buyable clothing and a buyable food. Yet this add multiple method is able to accept both of them. How come? Because I've defined what's allowed to be received by the parent class. All three of these child classes are buyables, meaning they count as fitting into this kind of overarching heading. However, the problem is, is that by being flexible like this, it also means that the item that comes in just knows itself as a generic buyable. It actually doesn't know what specific type of buyable it is. So I have to do some casting. I have to convert it back into the item that it really is with a couple checks. So the first thing that I need to do is check is this item actually a buyable clothing type item or is it a buyable food or is it a buyable game? Whichever one it is determines which of the master lists it needs to get added to. So I kind of have to like, it's like a little bit of a, uh, uh, think of working in a store yourself and you're standing on a conveyor belt looking at everything kind of coming into the conveyor and everything the conveyor allows anything in the store to be on it, but you have to package different things into different boxes based off the type. So you're watching and saying, okay, if this thing is a, some clothing, I stick it in box one. And if it's food, I stick it in box two and so on. And so I have to figure out what type of thing it is. And then I have to make sure that I cast the item type back to the one that it is. So you see item here is still considered a buyable. So I have to, I have to remind it, you're actually spe more specifically a piece of buyable clothing so that you can actually fit into the clothing array list properly. Similarly, the food has to be cast to fit into the food box and the game has to be cast to fit into the game box. 
So a pretty interesting algorithm there with a new idea, this instance of what type of thing are you in the inheritance structure? Let's go back to a couple of methods I skipped over. Up here, I allow anything else in different classes to actually to examine the full list of the full inventory. So what I do is actually I create a new list that's generically buyable that can fit all of the items. And then I add each of my other lists to this master list. This add all method allows me to append one list to another to another. And then I return this full inventory. This is what allows me to view all of the items available all at once. It's really flexible and a nice little algorithm to kind of take a look over. Next, I have a remove item from inventory method. I'm actually going to save talking about these into the next video where I'm going to talk about our main uh, functionality of our program here. But for now, let's listen to the video here, let you digest kind of a lot of these helper organizational methods that kind of build the, the backbone structure of the store, our bank account to manage funds, our buyables to manage the actual item inventory types, and the inventory that actually creates stores and manages those items. And in the next video, I'll talk about the store itself and explain how some of that menuing works.